MLB DFS is upon us, and thank goodness it's time to play. It's time to embrace the volatility of a super fun DFS sport, and I want to help you out with the best the way that I can, a tutorial. Let's go. Truly, MLB DFS is a lot of fun. I'm not even joking. If you learn how to embrace the volatility, leverage the ownership of the field, if you understand where the public might be, you have a chance to make money and win a lot of it. It's very hard. I'm not going to pretend it's not, but hopefully this video will allow you to feel more confident going into it. That's the MO of TeamRiserFall.com in all things that we do. We want to help you learn how to play, build good lineups, and then ultimately compete. There are a few things that we've done differently to make everything downloadable and uploadable into Fantasy Cruncher. Also have added uh, core lineup sheets. We've done pick sheets, pick pools. We have a strategy notebook daily that we will use to try to identify these things that we think will help you win. Now, what are some of those things? Well, the first one is stacking. Now, everyone knows that term, and for the most part, everybody understands it's crucial. You cannot win a tournament without it more often than not. Will it happen sometimes? Yeah, sure, everything happens. It's DFS. You know, it's still going to be some outlier slates, some outlier weeks. You might go through a little phase where you see a bunch of 2-2, two, 3-2 two, two stacks that win you a tournament. Now, is that the commonplace? No, it's not. In fact, the most widely used stack last year on DraftKings was 5-2, and on top of that, it had the highest win rate in tournaments. Now, if you are to stack it any other way, one of the two more common ways to stack an MLDFS on DraftKings is running out 5-3 stacks or 4-3 stacks. What does that mean? What does that mean when I say these numbers if you've never heard it before? Well, let me break that down too because we're all here and we all start somewhere. Now, that means you've identified an offense that you think for whatever reason, has a chance to pop off. Or maybe you're leveraging the ownership against a high-owned pitcher, so you're using this the, uh, the opposing hitters as a stack so that if 50% of the field has that pitcher and your team against him goes nuclear, you're going to be in a very small portion of the field screeching up the standings. So if you say you like the Yankees that day against a left-handed pitcher and you're going to you know, stack up a bunch of Yankees hitters and you decide, I want five Yankees. I hope they go for 15 runs and you have your five. And then that means everybody else who had four Yankees, well, you have an extra Yankee in a team that had 15 runs today. You have a little bit of an edge on all the four-man stacks. Or everybody that had a three-man Yankee stacks, they're dead in the water for the most part because you have five. And hopefully your five are the right five. So you, when you stack, you don't want to also just say, I love the Yanks today. I want the first, third, fifth, sixth, and ninth hitter. For the most part, you want their order to be semi-close. You want there not to be many gaps, maybe one gap max, two gaps at most. And you want to try to layer your hitter so that if your leadoff hitter gets on base, the second guy hits a double, now all of a sudden they're on second and third, the third guy comes up and jacks one out of the park, you get you know two, RBI, two extra RBIs because you had two base runners on, and you get the points from the guy on second and third scoring. So basically what you want to happen is you want your consecutive stacked batters to drive in the players that are on the base. Now, this is why it's important when you do stacking to most often use bigger stacks. Now, on FanDuel, it's a bit different. The most you can use is four. So you can go a 4-4 stack, which is actually one of the underused stacks. I believe it was third or fourth last year. And while you think that would be the most used, people have often tried on FanDuel going out with 4-3 stacks. Now, what that means is that they like four Yankees, three Padres, and then that one-off, you'll hear that term, one-off hitter, ends up being somebody who either is the highest value left on your projections or has the highest ceiling left on your projections. And you grab that player and you have them be your last hitter. You can even have them be the first one you plug into your roster if you want. But I always suggest starting your lineup from building from the stacks and go from there. The stack is the driver of the outcome of your lineup. You can be perfect with both pitchers, and if your stacks uh, completely you know, get crushed in that game, strike out eight times, and score two runs, it's over. I don't care if your pitcher went for 65. You're going to have a tough time in tournaments, not only cashing out, but you ain't winning a tournament. So I think focusing on stacks and tournaments – First thing you should always do. Now, deciding on the size of the stack is important, of course, but the pitching would be the next thing, and it's often totally misused. A lot of people, I think, they look at the top of their lineup when they're scrolling on FanDuel or on DraftKings or on their phone or in an optimizer, and the first thing they look at is the pitcher. Why? Because when you're on those websites, the pitcher's the very first thing listed. 
All right. So if the entire field's going, well, I want this pitcher, this pitcher, and then they're thinking about their stacks afterwards, I think they're doing it backwards. You go through, you find that one offense you want to leverage against some of that higher own pitching, and you plug that offense in, you go for a you know four or five man stack, find another offense if you'd like to do that next. But I think after you find that first initial stack, the next thing is go ahead and identify your pitchers. All right. You can either do the both of them on DraftKings or just go with your first one. I always like to try to pay up at my first one. And then the second one, a lot of the field goes stud and dud. They'll pay up for you know a, a 9 or 10k guy and then they'll pay down for a 5k guy uh, I'm not a big fan of that in fact I, I saw a recent article on Fancy Cruncher which reviewed 72 of the main slates for last MLB season and I believe over 70% of the winners ended up having, you know, a combined salary of between 15 and 18K uh, for the pitchers. So I think DraftKings, you pay up for the first one. The second one, you find the highest upside with the second arm. You truly just find the highest upside and go from there, whatever price range that ends up being. And if you're inherently paying down for a 5K, 4K guy, you know, 5.5K, they're probably not going to have that upside that needed that you need them to have to win a tournament. Now, did it happen sometimes? Yeah, I mean, 29% of the time, people were winning tournaments with ooh, spending less money. So don't take this as, uh, you know, the rule. Everything in DFS should be guidelines. These are the guidelines I loosely follow while I build. Does that mean sometimes I'll have two pitchers that are $7,000 or less? Absolutely. It's MLB DFS. Each and every slate is different. It's unique on its own. And that's why it's daily fantasy sports. And that's why we love it so much. So don't become beholden to a certain structure of building your lineups. Now, when you're doing pitching, on FanDuel, I think that that is a spot where you can probably do last. There are always so many arms. There's a lot of guys in that 7K range, 8K range on FanDuel that have elite upside, and you often can get there by, you know, racking up some extra strikeouts, which are three points each, you know, getting that quality start, nice win bonus. That stuff adds up really quick over on FanDuel. Now, when you are building your lineups, a video like this gives you a strong baseline knowledge. I feel like you should watch this video. You understand how to build. You understand how to play, but it still pays to be able to make sure that you can see it being done live. So what I'm going to do over the next two days is release two more videos. One of them is going to be how to win MLB DFS tournaments, in which I will show you how to build tournament-based lineups geared towards either a small field or a large field. I will also be showing how to build MME lineups in Fantasy Cruncher. I'm going to show everybody how to use the stack features, how to use the different player pool features, advanced options, all of it. Let me do the whole shebang. The other video is going to be centered around building a single entry lineup or a cash game build. How do I do this? Well, I am a huge believer in building optimal lineups. The optimal lineup video has several thousand views here for NBA, and I'm fairly sure that after the success I've seen my members over at TeamRiserFall.com, we have over 1,500 people in Discord. I think something's going well for us in our sixth month, right? Uh, if you use promo code STREAM above my head, it ends up taking $5 off your first month and ends up making it less than a dollar a day forever. So give that a look. And I want you to check out that optimal lineup building video and the MME DFS tournament winning video that will both drop in the next couple days. Together we rise, my friends. I'll see you on the inside.